Um, so, Joe Barry Rokas. Now, I did write this down, but I'm not going to get it right. <laughs> this is your <laughs> second name. <laughs> My second name, it's always a problem. Uh, so, I'll say it. It's Leon Avicius. But that's one of the reasons why I just say Rokas Leo, because it's Lithuanian surnames often are troublesome. So. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, a lot of people struggle with Irish names, too. So. <laughs> true, true, true. Um, so Rokas will be, I guess, known for some as the Aikido guy, um, some now known as the martial arts journey guy. Um, so I guess kind of can you explain what that means. To <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, so there were definitely stages. Uh, so I started a YouTube channel as I was running an Aikido, professional Aikido school. And uh, I started putting some content on YouTube. And because that's already kind of touching the big, the big picture, but because in Aikido, the Confucianism philosophy is quite powerful, whether people know it or not, but basically the hierarchy. Mm. Uh, it's, co- it's not common for young people to teach Aikido, not only because older people are more interested in it, but also uh, there's that image of the old, you know, yeah, wise sensei, grandmaster, exactly. And and even if you're if you're young, you you try not to kind of push yourself into the into everybody's eyes. But I was like, can I swear? Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, good. I was like, fuck him. And I decided to put put out some content on YouTube, which was uh, much more accessible because the the old school guys. They're, they usually don't give out everything and they're very dry in the way they explain. There's some good examples, but most of them. And so most of the YouTube content was very dry. And I was like, no, I'll be a simple, casual guy showing you my Aikido stuff. And people liked it and it became like one of the biggest channels of Aikido in the world. Then short version of the story, I ditched Aikido. So I became known as the ex-Aikido guy. Uh, but then I started training MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And uh, after I had my first MMA fight, and got my blue belt. I guess now it's easier to identify me not as the um, ex Aikido guy because before I was like neither MMA guy, neither Jiu-Jitsu guy. I was I was no one. I was nothing. <laughs> I'm still kind of that, but I'm getting there. So so I was like ex Aikido guy, but now I guess I'm transitioning to the martial arts journey guy because I'm just going everywhere with martial arts and exploring and questioning, and so it's probably best to keep it open. Yeah, it's funny because like I came across you. Like back when you were the Aikido guy, because mm. I really like your videos. Because I mean, I've come from, I guess, a kind of traditional martial arts background, but mm. I was like, this guy's videos are actually really good. Like you're, you were so open to ideas even at that stage. Mm. Like obviously you had the Aikido mindset, but it was like right. you were yeah. still like, oh, but what about this thing? What about this right. thing? Like yeah. I really loved that attitude mm. that you had with stuff. Mm. But like I, like I said it just before we came on and recorded that like I've seen and I've kind of gone through this. A similar journey in some ways as yourself but I've seen mm-hmm. it like in the gym where guys will come in and they think like oh I've done X martial art for years mm-hmm. and they're like oh I'm going to do great and then within five minutes they're like what have I like, right. been doing yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 but like you had it documented and put mm-hmm. it in front of the world and you were so open about it which mm-hmm. was phenomenal like mm. um, and yeah you started training MMA in Oregon originally yeah, uh, actually, I started still back in Lithuania uh, to a degree. Yeah. Uh, so, again, to the uninitiated, <laughs> a short version is I tested my Aikido against an MMA guy, mm. recorded it, sucked. Yeah, you want to... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I recorded the Aikido versus MMA fight, uh, sparring, uh, got my ass handed to me, which I expected, but mm. still. Uh, but the surprisingly, the to my surprise, the MMA world, including Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they respected it. They yeah. saw it as a good as a good sign. I thought they will just laugh from me. <laughs> uh, but that kind of pushed me to further explore the support and also the realization that some people are still not getting it. Some people still didn't believe that. St- some people blamed me as a practitioner versus the martial yeah. art, and uh, I, I felt like I need to further explore this 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 journey and it was also an inter- internal journey because i was like <clears throat> so what the heck is this so, so so what is how much was i light to and i knew that aikido is not very effective already after like a decade of training but i the more i went into it the more i realized it's even less and less and less effective mm-hmm. to a degree where i'll almost give no effi- efficiency to in in the sense of self defense but then uh, uh, that journey led me to try out other martial arts and I started training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu 
uh, actually while I was still before the Aikido versus MMA a guy introduced me to it and I liked it a lot but uh, eventually I started going to a gym then I did a few MMA sessions but I'm a guy who likes things broken down yeah like I really want to understand what am I what am I and why am I doing and we spoke about all of our income yeah. uh, I, I spoke to him as well a professional uh, MMA fighter uh, karate guy as well by the way and he 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 got this idea from somewhere else but he, he introduced it to me that there's like different types of mindsets or types of people the way they train that there's a martial artist fighter and athlete and the short version again that the fighter is the one who's just like they don't need to understand why they just need to brawl and you show they do and you know and they 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 just fight they have the instinct of fighting and they evolve through fighting but the martial artist which i consider myself to be that mindset uh and oliver is the same by the way we want to understand it's not enough for us to somebody shows and to like go and do it i'm like but why what about this what about that and so that was the method which i was uh which was accessible to me in the gyms around where i lived and i was like oh no i feel like i'm not getting what i want i need to fast track my progress and I, and I want to learn this in an efficient way and uh, lucky enough I got an opportunity to go to Oregon Portland where uh, there was a six months training program every day from teaching you the basics and that was probably the, the main introduction for me to MMA besides the fact that I did a little bit before that so nice yeah it's funny because uh, I mean, we chatted about this earlier as well the uh, oh here goes the car oh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so actually, as we were speaking about earlier, about like the the concept of the way like sports science is so kind of mm. far ahead, that analogy they gave of like those three types, that's actually something I use when training people. That there's like, mm. mm -hmm. it's kind of an accepted thing. I'm, I'm probably going to butcher the exact science of this, but like there's three neural types of like mm. essentially like the technique geek mm. who wants things broken down, wants yeah. like stuff explained, the like show and show and go sort of guy. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it's so funny that like someone. So obviously trained for so long and just has their own way mm. like oh here's what it is mm -hmm. um but i suppose the other thing as well that i kind of wanted to highlight was like for yourself doing the aikido it wasn't just a case of oh this is my hobby and mm. like i was humbled in it like that was your living mm -hmm. at the time absolutely it was my main profession uh i had a successful dojo yeah uh which was like it, it, the city i lived in was fairly small so so it made it a bigger achievement even still uh, had about like 150 members but that's like kids yoga and aikido but the aikido group was big like it was full mat especially when i pushed myself to 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 make it work then the mat was full to a degree where i couldn't have more students so in a way it was very successful <clears throat> i was living off of it and uh, i did things around the dojo like corporate seminars based but it was, it was all based on aikido like aikido in the corporate setting and uh, or Aikido philosophy for like relationships or whatever, whatever, whatever. So I did a bunch of all those things, and I did yoga too. So, so that, but that was again. So everything revolved around it. Uh, and when I did the Aikido versus MMA video, initially that was already like a risk. Mm -hmm. I realized that um, although I was open to my students, and I would already say to them, "Well, Aikido is not that effective," but I, but I didn't like, as I mentioned before, I didn't think it's that that ineffective. But I still I would kind of caution them. But when I went into the, the the ring to pressure test my Aikido and it failed miserably, I thought, well, there's a chance my students will leave me because of that. And I might lose already my livelihood, but I was like, well, fuck it, I need to do it anyway. But but it was a risk. Uh, some students were upset, but few. Uh, most of them were supportive, which was good. But yeah, eventually when I closed down the dojo <clears throat> to train MMA full-time for that moment, uh, it was a bit risky, but at the same time, I had faith in my ability to make things happen and also I did know that my YouTube channel was already picking up to a degree where uh, it, it, it could become a substitute if I would the, the, the same amount that I invest into the dojo which took a lot of energy yeah. if I would you want to fuck? No, you could. <laughs> uh, if I would uh, invest the same amount to YouTube I, I saw that it would work out so so I did feel like there's a substitute but also there were no guarantees so, so. yeah yeah, I mean, that's like a, that's why I like, had such admiration for you at the time watching that, because mm -hmm. like, like I'd seen 
in the kind of lead up to the Yankee Universe of America, like I'd seen in YouTube comments, it was like, oh, but what about, you know, yeah, you right. versus this or you versus that or how would you do in this sort of situation? Yeah. You saw, I don't know, maybe your own mind process, like mm-hmm. you kind of see in the background, you're kind of thinking like, oh, but what if? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then to see it happen and then like for mm. your reaction to it, I have such yeah. admiration for it because mm. like kind of like you touched on earlier, like I've seen in a lot of different disciplines, normally the reaction when someone questions it like that it's usually either you're not doing it right Mm -hmm. you need to do more of it or you don't know the super Mm -hmm. secret techniques that you got to go and find somewhere Mm -hmm. that no one can somehow point you towards yeah which i've seen in all sorts of disciplines never mind martial arts like i mean Mm -hmm. like i won't even i don't want to name any because i want to come under heat (laughs) (laughs) like it's it's funny to see that reaction across the board and so many things but then to see how honestly that you approached it or mm. it was quite humbling I guess to, mm. <laughs> to actually see from an outsider mm. um, and I suppose like was it kind of shocking to you to see the, the reaction of both sides mm. yeah well well, first of all thank you yeah. you're saying. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and it's actually uh, to go step by step it's actually very cool that you've been uh, you know you're, you've been involved and, and saw my journey from the early stages because most yeah. people jumped into the into the wagon sooner or later. So there's mm-hmm. people who, you know, know me after Aikido or Sydney, and some people who tuned in from then. Very few people already saw the process before Aikido or Sydney may happened. Uh, but you're you're spot on. That that was the thing that <clears throat> I would read the comments and well, f- first of all, for me, my golden pillar, my golden phrase is the right way is the is the one which works. And for me, it was always very important to be very good and very effective in what I do, whatever that would be. And I realized that <clears throat> if I wouldn't, if I don't receive feedback, that's not going to get me far. That I do need to question my methods in order to improve myself. Yeah. That that kind of understanding was there in the back of my mind. So so when somebody would say, "Oh, this sucks," or "or you should do this this way," or "What about that?" I would be like, "What if the guy's right? You know, there's an opportunity to learn here." So I was kind of using those opportunities. But the thing which definitely frustrated me <clears throat> in the Aikido community. Because, as I said, the, the videos were big and the channel was popular. The Aikido channel was popular across the Aikido glo- world very much. Like, I, I became the Aikido guy in, in, in the whole Aikido community. And then um, the part of the Aikido culture is you're, the, the culture of you're doing it wrong. You know, every style. And I think some martial arts are guilty of that too, like more traditional martial arts. But it's like our style is the best and yours is, is the worst and and we do it right you're doing it wrong it after a lot of explorations i realized probably that's a lot due to the fact that there's no pressure testing mm-hmm. so it's easy to say my style is the best and no one is going to prove it yeah. you know it's like you're, you're not going to compare and, no and try yeah exactly exactly so it's easy to claim that mm-hmm. and that's why everybody does it but uh, that's what got me first frustrated because i would release aikido tutorials and i knew that aikido is not very effective already and I would just make those videos in order to introduce to people who are struggling to learn Aikido because <clears throat> it's a tough one to learn, actually. Mm-hmm. There's so many details and so many specific uh, intricacies. And, and I was like, I was imagining my, my, my ideal client kind of from a marketing perspective that it's the person who's struggling to learn Aikido. That was like, and that, that's actually what really drove me when I taught Aikido. I, 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 the talented students, I was like, oh, you're good anyway. But the ones who like couldn't get it, I was like, oh, I want to teach that person. And so when I was making YouTube videos, I was like, okay, I want to help those people to understand how to get these things done. So it was all about mechanics. It wasn't about, oh, this technique is all about if somebody really grabs you like this, you're going to do this. But comments, the guys were like, oh, but your foot is like five angles wrong. And I was like, Dude, it doesn't matter. It doesn't work anyway. It's like, why Why do you care? Why do you even write this comment? It's like, or it's like, oh, you're doing this technique wrong. I'm like, how do you know? And then I got so frustrated that that's one of the big reasons why I decided to make the Akira or Cinema video. I, I thought that will put a stop to the whole conversation. <laughs> I'll be like, works. it's like, yeah, just watch this video. It doesn't work. And so stop criticizing my techniques because it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> so so that process was, was definitely there. Yeah, yeah like I think it's... We talked about the, the Dog Brothers before, and they're uh, a funny crowd for catchphrases, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and one that kind of they said to me years ago that always stuck in my mind is, if you see it taught, you see it fought. Mm. And that it doesn't matter what it is. If it's, you can't test it, 
Yeah, right. It doesn't really work. Um, but kind of something that I suppose kind of I don't know, mm-hmm. kind of cut, circling around in a way that like one thing that I've seen. I think why I actually came to your channel was because mm. I guess you for myself going through something similar that like I went oh that's bullshit I'll never come back to this mm. and then years later I was like no, but maybe there was useful stuff in that mm. like I think you kind of see that kind of reinvention in MMA with like guys like the <laughs> the classic joke of the front snap kick for years everyone was like no that'll never work in MMA and then Anderson Silva started knocking people out with it and you're like oh maybe this actually mm. does work in MMA mm. that like people I think within a lot of those martial arts there is valid things but because mm. people aren't willing to take that step back be honest about mm-hmm. it and question it that they don't mm-hmm. Don't test it. Really. <coughs> I just need to <coughs> <coughs> clear my throat. Something is stuck. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. And even like if you if you look at it from a logical perspective, in the past martial arts were a life and death matter. Yeah. Like uh, I I would think about that sometimes when I would even teach Aikido. That Aikido comes from classical traditional jujitsu, but then if I would be a samurai, a few hundred years ago. I would train that technique like I would you know, really want to make sure that this technique is effective because if it fails I will die you know it's like and and that death is it was imminent it was like present everywhere like any random guy could attack me with a sword in the street it was like so such an actual life situation well these days we know that it's like eh, you know I might get attacked once in my life so we were kind of casual a bit more casual about it but I thought what if I would train Aikido now, in that way, if I was back training back then, it would have been such a different way. But that's where the martial art is born from. So those guys who invented the martial art initially, it had to work. Yeah. You know, it just it just had to. But you again, one opportunity to get it wrong. Right, exactly. And and so so the, there was kind of a pressure testing uh, aspect to it, or it had to be. But the problem is again these days, and there's stories. And not, I don't want to put too much weight on that side, but mm-hmm. it's interesting to recognize that <coughs> that uh, there's a lot of martial arts stories where the martial art was softened down for the new generation. Yeah. Like you know, judo was and judo is awesome, by the yeah. way. Like but the introduction of belts. I mean, that was right. Exactly. Judo making it settable right. to the West. Yeah. Right. And then and but and then again, Kano himself apparently, from what I read. He like jujitsu was considered like dirty, like it was like oh, it's fighting and everything, and he wanted to make something more softer, approachable. Although <laughs> judo is still hardcore, yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of the direction. Or kendo versus kenjutsu, you couldn't carry a sword and cut people around anymore. So it's like oh, let's create something which is kind of like it. And and then eventually, or or I heard actually numerous stories about masters, grandmasters, like the Ch- Chinese kung fu, including who would complain that they would come to the West and no one would train in the and I'm not saying train hardcore I don't think that's the solution but they were used to training hardcore Mm -hmm. and the westerners wouldn't come if you would teach that way so they were forced to kind of make it more mcdojo in order to you know to to make it accessible so they could make a living but then generation to generation to generation if you're teaching in a mcdojo way then it's just going to get more and more McDojo because there's no inherent setup which makes sure that your martial art is first effective versus get students coming. So, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a rabbit hole, but... Yeah, like I saw a funny kind of contradiction going on within martial arts. But I, I guess when I started to really dive into it, I saw that you had those traditional like martial arts as such rather than the sportive arts, but the sportive ones are the ones where you still see the pressure testing but right. obviously then it's limited within a rule set so then you always get the classic oh they have rules and <coughs> mm-hmm. take it to the streets you know that i mean i'm sure you've had <laughs> oh yeah, it's, uh, comments on yeah it's one of the, the the common ones right yeah, yeah. but like mm-hmm. you can't train most of these things then in a way mm-hmm. where it is safe so i guess for anyone who's a grappler would know like the, the leg scissor takedown mm-hmm. is something of Plenty of people have probably seen it in kung fu movies and everything else that that's been banned in a lot of grappling competitions mm. because people have broken their legs very badly from yeah. it. But it works. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's people are like, oh, it's too deadly for whatever. Mm. It's not really. It's like you can still train it. You can train it in a very safe way, but yeah. to use it in a, like in a, a pressure tested way, you're putting someone else's right. yeah. long term like 
yeah, yeah. life at risk, I guess. Yeah, I definitely, definitely want to jump in here too because, <clears throat> first of all, what comes to my mind is there is a, so I'm I consider myself to be part of the SBG tribe, mm. and uh, one of the coaches there, uh, Paul Sharp, he is like a ex SWAT uh, undercover officer, like he's been for everything, and and also in Chicago, so you know oh, he's right. <laughs> he's been for it all. Yes, and he's a high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt too. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, so he's a, you know, he's he could kill someone easily. Uh, he knows his stuff. His self-defense uh, approach is, is very legit. Uh, but uh, he he has a saying that if I could uh, take care of you uh, with rules, what makes you think I wouldn't be able to do that without rules? And I think that's a powerful phrase, which makes people think. You can still kind of intellectually try to nitpick it and like, oh, but, you know, the, the famous groin and, and <laughs> eyes and gouging and whatnot. But but there's even, like, a video which mm, shows you that it's a bit of a silly argument. Uh, specifically, there's one video with the Gracies where they did the... Mm, the challenges. And, yeah, the challenges, yeah. right. And there's a Kung Fu guy, uh, the Gracie, I don't know which one was it, but... Uh, puts him down and he kind of mounts him on top and spreads him out and he says the kung fu master and he's narrating it Mm -hmm. and she's like "Uh, and then the kung fu master he really became uh, what's then he started panicking and he tried to go for my groin you know and that's like he's like like calmly just telling the story and then he's like but he was not successful so he didn't you know do it and I think there's like eye gouging attempts as well and it's, it doesn't work eventually but that's the thing because you know it's uh, there is a good saying that if you want to go guy i gouge you need to practice it mm-hmm. you need to literally practice it this is one of the reasons why there's better techniques than eye gouging you know it's like there's there's other solutions which you can pressure test and get used to doing and again if you can do that and and you can be able to pull that off against a guy who knows how to fight yeah. why rely on those things you can't pressure test even if they are potentially successful if you can use something which can be applied even under rules uh, and of course there is the second side to the coin which i think if if there is a there is a gap between self defense and sports but that gap is i think it's much smaller than people think and 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 what i specifically referred to uh, is like a friend of mine the bouncer he says his boxer uh, friends, professional boxers, they have trouble sometimes in bouncing, bouncing, yeah. being German, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, because they're used to clean, solid punches, and when a guy comes with a random whatever, yeah. they sometimes don't know how to react. But you just have to be conscious of it and just make a sh- small shift and introduce that to yourself if, if you are planning to apply your boxing under those circumstances. But it's, it's a small shift. And if you do that, you're good. It's not like, oh, you need to retrain your entire curriculum just because you're a sports guy. Yeah. It's like, no, I could kill you one way or another. Yeah, yeah like so. I, that's actually really perfect. Like, yeah. I use the, the spazzy white belt analogy. Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. that, for anyone not familiar with it, when you, someone begins in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they may come in and do something that you've never seen before just because they have no idea what they're doing. Right. And you go, like, what the hell was that? It takes you back for a second, and then you go, all right, well, I just go back to what I know, and then right. it takes over and you're done yeah exactly and people get so like oh no it must be this specific deadly technique mm. but yeah like like you said I mean when you can actually test this stuff out um, I had a friend of mine uh, Thomas Holtman so a uh, German guy mm-hmm. highly recommend every, if you ever get an opportunity mm. to meet him so he's a mm. uh, he's in Jiu Jitsu black belt Judo black belt I think Taekwondo black belt uh, full dog brother all sorts of I don't know I don't know how many accolades that guy has in martial arts but he got very heavily involved in uh, Chinese Kung Fu and I think Southern Mantis um, mm. you know slap me for getting this wrong but um, <laughs> I mean his reason for getting into the dog brothers was the same that he learned uh, like three section staff and other things and was like oh I want to see if this stuff actually works and then did but then obviously had the realisation well what if someone grabs me so then he's like well I've presented Jiu Jitsu and then mm. <laughs> like people get so it's I think the thing that MMA showed people, yet you know, I think that a lot of people still aren't willing to accept, is that there isn't one style that fixes everything. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think even within MMA, people agree with that because, like I've seen Thomas talk about it as well, as well as the Gracies and others, where it's like, um, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu will work for most people, but obviously the sportive version, like you don't need to baron in the street, like it's mm-hmm. not going to be a very effective thing. But 
like those crazy challenges the one of my favorite ones was uh i think they fought a karate school it's like old black and white footage mm. and the karate school were like all right well we'll only fight you on a in a set um arena with like tiled floors mm. So the Gracie's like, okay, and then they just see a naggy the guy onto the ground. <laughs> and then they're like, well, we'll land on you. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, you're not making it better for yeah, yourself. You made it worse for yourself, if anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. like, I guess to come back even further, because this is something that people normally never ask in these situations. Um, mm -hmm. What got you into martial arts in the first place? <laughs> um, I was always interested in, in the Asian culture. I mean, it's not as much anymore, to be honest, but in the past, uh, you know, I enjoy my animes and, <laughs> and manga and the samurai culture. And I think the samurai culture was always like, back in the day was, was very kind of attractive to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also too, an important factor was that I was growing up in a city which was uh, called the Little Chicago, speaking of Chicago. <laughs> so there was a lot of uh, crime and violence around. Uh, sp both among adults, uh, like gangs, gang wars, and also teens, which were replicating that. And I was on the side, which were on the receiving end, in the group, which was on the receiving end of it. So while I wasn't... You can make a chair. So while I wasn't uh, getting beat up uh, badly, mm -hmm. I didn't get to, I, st I was still facing a lot of violence. Uh, but why it was Aikido that got into... Became my first official and main martial art is because uh, it was uh, marketing itself as defend yourself without hurting another person. Although when you look at it, kind of doesn't really make sense even yeah. with Aikido <laughs> techniques. It's just a philosophy. The philosophy is there, and that's maybe why it's there because it's spoken about it. But technically, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is way more effective at it yeah. because choking out is probably the most peaceful way you can end a conflict. Aikido, on the other hand, most of it is froze and and it's deadly yeah. it's actually it's not very safe Spiking at all someone on their head <laughs> yeah right exactly so it's 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 crazy how people and including myself back in the day lack critical thinking to to actually ask yourself so is this really giving what it's promising versus oh it says it does and it, it says a hundred arguments why it does although no proof and you believe it but anyway so so yeah but uh, a friend of mine invited me to aikido I tried it out and it had all the elements. It had the samurai culture, which was a big thing for me. Uh, and it had the the promise of being able to defend uh, yourself and others and uh, without using violence, because I was not a violent guy growing up. And uh, also to the philosophy resonated with me, like the founder. He also spoke about fulfilling yourself and, and serving others. And, and that was always kind of, I was leaning towards that. Uh, ever since I was uh, a small child, so so all of that, I was like, okay, I like this. So yeah. nice. Mm. Yeah, I uh, I have talked about it with people a lot before. I got a copy of it. I think it's mm. it's actually on my corner table there. Mm. I got a pocket book of the Book of Five Rings when I was twelve. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of like sparked everything. Mm. I like obviously watched Bruce Lee movies and Jackie Chan sure. films as a kid, but then read that and that so many things resonated with me. I was like, fucking cool stuff yeah, yeah it was uh and it's one of those things actually that like i talked about this recently on instagram i think but there's a section in that and i as soon as i saw it with the uh, Cerrone mcgregor fight mm -hmm. i put it up because there's a section that says you know that one of the few strikes that you can kill a man with is with your shoulder mm -hmm. and he says it in the book he says uh i forget the exact line but something along the lines of hit him with it and keep hitting him with it until he dies Oh shit! And then I, I like that just flashed back into my mind because even at the time I was like, Jesus, a shoulder strike! And then I watched Connor do it, and I was like, Ah, fuck! <laughs> there you go. And then everyone, I guess, classic thing. I'm like, Oh, that wouldn't work. That's you know, you know, throw only throw in the fight, and all. And you, know, and you see his orbital was shattered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people are really removed from the reality of fighting. Mm -hmm. I think what sure. you were saying earlier that like the mm -hmm. not being tested, mm -hmm. people don't. Quite understand what it is to actually be in a fight sure so yeah. I kind of, what I wanted to ask you was mm -hmm. what was it like for you actually getting punched for the first time <laughs> um, I was actually like properly punched probably during my MMA training mm -hmm. like that was the, 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 the actual fighting because in the in the streets <laughs> when I was a teenager and I would get into violent situations uh, I was always able to kind of 
find a way out. Yeah. Either by defending a few strikes and then talking the guy down and calming the guy down, or 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 by just talking my way out of it. So I never actually got punched properly, although there were opportunities, but never happened. Uh, I got pepper sprayed once. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't <laughs> fun. But that I I was able to run away nevertheless, but but not punched. Um, being punched when you look at even the Aikido or some, maybe you know, it's, it's evident that I was flinching a lot, mm. uh, and I think that's that's a natural reaction. Some oh, people, okay. uh, I think there's again a, a, an unhealthy myth that you're either a flincher or you know you're not. I think it's 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 just natural for the brain to kind of the protective mechanism which you need to go against. You need to counter it which everybody who does you know, fighting knows. Uh, so it took me a while. Uh, if I'm overwhelmed, I can still feel that there's a bit of a flinching in me. Not to say that it's not there anymore, but there's definitely a lot of progress. But initially, I don't know, it's part of me actually even liked it, mm-hmm. getting punched in the face. Uh, most of it happened initially in, in Portland. There was a lot of sparring. Light sparring, but a lot of sparring, but light sparring, a lot of punches to the face. And actually, I, I, I enjoyed, to a degree, being punched in the face, especially when I was light, because I realized, oh, you know, I'm finally getting yeah, the real thing. To do. <laughs> yeah, so so there there was this kind of uh, masochistic, <laughs> almost, but sense of, uh, yes. Uh, obviously, I don't like to be punched hard. <laughs> like, if some, if some guy accidentally goes harder... Then he needs to. Then it's more upsetting. Like, what the fuck are you doing now? What what, what are we going into? But uh, it just uh, took a while to get used to. It, but but partly it was it was um, healthy in a way. <laughs> so yeah, it's funny because like I've especially uh, I trained with a lot of like taekwondo guys over the years, and it's always funny that some of them are like, used to getting hit in the head, but then you add in the one variable that no one ever seems to think about in fights: leg kicks, <laughs> and then mm-hmm. the whole world flips upside down. Yeah, uh, I remember a friend of mine, uh, David Logan, the pro kickboxer. I remember him kicking me in the legs like hard for the first time. We were just kind of mess sparring, and oh, yeah, still flashbacks at that moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's been a such a fascinating journey of years to follow. So um, mm. yeah, I mean, what's what's next for you? So I am on a journey like a, like a, a journey for the, towards the next journey uh, but so basically it's spreading into into two different uh, roads um, and it's still a work in progress uh, but when I so after Portland to, to include everyone I moved for three months to Dublin mm-hmm. and trained at SVG Ireland with the with the pro team although I'm not anywhere <laughs> near their level uh, and that was a good and a bad thing for me because after those three months, because I was training daily, mm-hmm. uh, pretty much, sometimes twice per day, uh, and the pro team session drained me entirely. And I think part of it, both physically and emotionally, because I was uh, 90% of the time I was the underdog yeah. because they were so much better. Uh, and part of me, I, I saw the benefit of it. I enjoyed it. I was like, oh, yes, this is, you know, this is great. Uh, to, to experience that level to learn with the best uh, but but also I, I, I consider that you have to have a ratio like a balance between a sense of success and failure yeah. and if you fail too often that does start to get in your head it's You're like 70-30 uh, you ever see the, the rap test? no actually no tell me it's, uh, this is actually something that I think anyone learning a new skill but especially something like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu mm-hmm. Um, this is a skill that I've tried to explain to white belts before that, that there was a test done on rats where they got them to play with each other and I know humans and rats are obviously different but they found the magic <laughs> ratio of if so the rats wouldn't actually naturally do this with each other so they'd have a big rat who wanted to play and a little one that obviously couldn't mm-hmm. match them in, mm-hmm. a, in a physical contest but the big rat would purposely lose 30% of the time ah. because otherwise the little one would start to stop playing and quit mm-hmm. and I think That's it's good. kind of the it's kind of the magic ratio for a lot of people mm-hmm. that you want the thing to be challenging to the point where I want to feel like I'm actually being challenged by this but if you're being crushed 90 plus percent of the time it's soul destroying <laughs> it is it is absolutely and, and I, I was able I have a, I think I have a strong mindset uh, I, I did uh, I constantly push myself out of the comfort zone so I think I'm used to it and that kind of develops the character yeah. 
Uh, so for about two months, I was kind of holding it together, feeling like, okay, this, this is good, this is good, this is good. But by the third month, I was physically exhausted. And also, too, the, the thing is, uh, I also noticed that recently training jiu-jitsu is uh, when you're training with different levels, let's say there's a um, five, six-minute uh, rolls. Yeah. And then if you're rolling with a guy who's, uh, whose skill set is inferior to yours, like, like on, on a pretty big, big uh, gap, then you're not investing that much energy. You're just yeah. kind of playing, giving him the moments to try. You're suffocating him, or you know, you're you're you don't you're you don't he gets tired, he gets exhausted, but you don't as much. But when the guy is much better than you, there's still a natural desire to try to at least defend yourself properly, and so you're investing more. And so what I was each day when training with the pro team. Not only there's the stress of oh my god these are you know legit killers, <laughs> there's also the I'm trying to to survive so I was wasted after every class, after every training and then after two months I realized I'm out of my reserves psychologically it started becoming difficult I was like oh, this is this is tough and I, I I knew I will I committed to three months so I knew I will do it also I got injured the fa- the fight got canceled so that's that's also a, a, a kind of a mindset uh, downer <laughs> oh, I know that feeling <laughs> yeah it's uh, yeah it's one of the inevitable things it's uncomfortable for most fighters to hear mm. but you will get injured it's kind of mm. how you're able to deal with it and progress out of it I think is the right. the real trying thing for most people right yeah and I think so so I got I eventually got through it but also when I came back after those three months I moved back to my home country Lithuania and uh, I went to Jiu Jitsu Club for a month which I liked a lot, like like the coach is great, the, the, the community is great, the teaching level is great, but I realized I, I burnt myself out mm-hmm. from, from all the training. I trained, well basically I trained six months non-stop <laughs> <laughs> in Portland, I made a bit of a break, but then three months in Dublin, and so it's a lot from zero to, to that much, and with that high, at that high level. So I've, I realized, okay, I burnt myself out, but that actually brought something interesting because I had to question so, so okay, if I'm not doing martial arts, what am I? You know, what's 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 the thing? If because martial arts took so much, uh, such a big part, played such a big part in my in my life, uh, I had to ask. So, what's aside from martial arts? And there's a phrase which I ran into during that that questioning period, of um, uh, what you wouldn't get bored of. Mm-hmm. Like instead of like the I don't know who said it. It was a quote, but if you're doing something and you see that somewhere down the line you'll get bored of it, that means it's not your thing. And it's a bit of a you know it's a it's a bit of a bold thing to say. I think you have to be humble and understand that like the burnout is is a thing as well. Mm-hmm. You, you, it's not always about enjoying. Sometimes you can get bored. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. But still, I ask myself, so what wouldn't I get bored of? And I mentioned already in the podcast that part of it, uh, for me, part uh, an essential part of my character was always about wanting to serve others. It's kind of a, I always ask myself whether that's the best phrase to say, serve others, but kind of being valuable and useful to others and uh, supporting others. And uh, I realized that's a big thing. I, I love it. And I, I started questioning how could I use my skill set, filming, YouTube, in order to inspire people and and motivate them uh, outside of martial arts mm-hmm. because that was actually that's one of the things which frustrated me and maybe it's a bit of an ego thing but also maybe it's part of me wanting to just reach more people because i would meet someone and they would be like what are you doing us I, I would say i'm a youtuber that's my main profession right now and they're like oh so awesome so what do you do i'm like oh it's martial arts and they're like okay change subject <laughs> you know because <laughs> if you're not into martial arts you're not into martial arts and i was like i was frustrated because i the martial arts journey it has a universal message, mm. but if someone is not in martial arts, I, I'm very happy when I read the comments that someone is not doing martial arts and some people watch my channel anyway, that, that makes me super happy, but that's a very small number of people. So I ask myself, how can I do this outside of martial arts? And it's been a process. Uh, it's still fresh and recent, but there were uh, hits and misses. Uh, but uh, after I tried already had a few attempts at starting this this other journey of of including other people outside of martial arts i got a lot of feedback from my audience and eventually uh, i realized uh, long story short (laughs) i realized that uh, probably what i want to do next is not only continue to do martial arts which is part of the journey but as the secondary journey uh, to apply the same methodology that i applied to my martial arts to every aspect of 
of my life. Mm. So instead of me telling, oh, this is a good thing, do this, don't do that, etc., uh, pressure test my beliefs, pressure test uh, various methods of, per se, self-improvement. Uh, just there's so much that could be done. And, and one video I'll, I'll quickly share that I'm working on right now, which I'm quite excited so I'm pressure testing. I'm still questioning whether pressure testing is the right word, the right phrase, but it suits the moment. So I'm pressure testing superstitiousness. Right. So I did a bunch of things and recorded it, how I tried to make myself cursed, you know, break a mirror, yeah. put up all the cursed numbers, open up an umbrella in the room, like everything. Yeah. I found a list on Wikipedia. I did most of it that I could. And now I'm documenting t for 10 days, including the flight to Dublin, I didn't die. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> happened. Alive, folks. I'm still alive. <laughs> so, so, so I'm pressure testing and seeing how cursed can I be. So stuff like that. So yeah, that's a really cool concept. Man. Thank you. It's uh, it's interesting. I'm excited, but still need to find the the way it works. But but I'm getting there. One step at a time. It, like it's nice to like, kind of the way you're saying of like giving back. I know for you, obviously your your journey has changed. Mm. But even just like from watching you from back teaching Aikido days, I mm. think that's probably always. Mm been your drive in a lot of ways is to like whatever you do to have it of use to others not just yourself 100% you're, you're absolutely right and yeah. that, that's actually in a way it's quite insightful but but that that when I look back and especially these days when I started questioning so, so what my life is about uh, a key phrase a key word for for a long time for me was inspiration not only being inspired but inspiring others it's been with me since uh, early days childhood but then uh, it was very uh, uh, nice for me to see when the more I went on my martial arts journey, the more the word inspiration would pop up in people's comments. It's like, oh, this video is so inspiring or your journey is so inspiring. It's like, oh, that's the word that I, you know, that's what I want to do. And I, I realized I'm starting to achieve that in the martial arts journey. Uh, but when I started questioning my whole, my, my whole life, and I looked, I went back even before martial arts, I realized that I actually, one of the reasons I became an Aikido instructor initially was because Aikido inspired me. And part of me wanted to share that inspiration with others. I realized that's a community which I will build, people will come to me and, and, and we will sp spend time together, we'll talk about everything and that's, that's a good tool. And even back then I already saw it as a tool versus Oh, Aikido is everything for me. That's my whole life. It was partly my whole life in a way, but but it was more still of a tool versus you know, Aikido dot yeah. period. So, so yeah, you're you're right. Nice right. man. Yeah, I think that's a lovely spot to wrap up on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, how can people find you for that for you? Uh, so martial arts journey is the main uh, vehicle. Uh, YouTube, type in martial arts journey and. You'll see the, the stuff. I'll put yeah. lots of links and everything in, cool. in the descriptions. Thank you so much, man. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm.